Sometimes you don't set out in search of a story. Some stories have a way of finding you. So my name is uh, Tim Mallet and, and uh, the story. Well, I worked in a retirement community in the late 80s in Detroit and there was an estate sale and I uh, needed some bedroom furniture and I purchased a dresser for $25. And when I went to pick up the dresser, it was gone. Someone had taken it and the gentleman that was um, running the sale refused to give me my money back. And I was pretty insistent on getting 25 bucks back. He said he was not in the position to give me the $25, but there was a beat up, broken desk, tall desk with a drop front that was broken off in the corner, and he said that you can take that. Tim Mallard did not need a dilapidated old desk, but he took it because he wasn't getting his 25 bucks back. Carrying it upstairs to his place, though, Tim heard something. The mail cubby there, it was rattling a little bit. I thought, maybe I'll give it a tug and see what happens. And out came a drawer, which completely floored me. I was not expecting that. That drawer was a secret compartment. Tim didn't know it at the time, but what was inside would consume him for years. There was a British passport in there, old black and white photographs, and then curiously, a collection of old letters. It was all hidden away, out of sight, for who knows how long. Tim knew that the desk once belonged to a woman named Helen Seba. It was her picture in that British passport. But he didn't know much more, just that Mrs. Seba was a widow. Well, I knew, uh, I knew who she was. And uh, she was uh, in her 90s at the time, and she had a caregiver, and uh, I had assumed she had no family. I remember as I opened the documents, uh, there was one letter in particular that was more recently dated than the others. I believe it was from the 1970s. And uh, it had Hebrew script on the left, uh, an address in Tel Aviv, but the text was written in German, and I was like, that, that can't be right. I was struck first, why would a letter be coming uh, from Israel written in German? It was counterintuitive. I had the strong sense this was a Jewish family, uh, and I made that deduction, well obviously a letter from Israel helped in that conclusion. Uh, then I added to it the Red Cross uh, letter. I saw uh, the name Weiss, in there and I knew that to be uh, both a, a um, Jewish and a non-Jewish name uh, in Europe. Still it was all in disarray and tough to make sense of. But Tim found love letters in the pile and soon a picture began to emerge. 21. November 1939. My dear companion of my life, let us try not to think back. One year since immigration. Let us be happy that we are together again this year. We have to keep on going, all three of us. Your husband, a.k.a. Little Man, darling. Turns out Little Man is Max Seba, Helen's husband. Little Man, I know now, having seen the photos, which didn't exist when I first saw that, Max was short, and Helen was probably two or three inches, if not more, taller than him. So Little Man, and Little Man comes up more in the other letters. But the date of that letter there, that stuck out to Tim. And I'm thinking November 1938. Why does November 1938 stick in my mind? I, something, something bad happened in November 1938. And I'm like, the Kristallnacht. And I go, can't be. This can't be. And I went back and I looked at the dates um, on the note and went online and checked the dates for the Kristallnacht and they coincided. So this family uh, had fled and left and left in a hurry and uh, were grateful to be together. So all those clues added up uh, to me that, oh gosh, this confirms their Jewish identity. Max and Helen Seba were originally from Konigsberg, but lived here in Danzig. Today it's called Gdansk 
part of Poland and on the Baltic Sea. But in 1938, it was a tinderbox of hatred. The Sebas were already growing worried and sent their teenage daughter Hilda to live in England. Then when Kristallnacht happened, that night of violence and vandalism against Jews, Max fled there as well. Helen followed weeks later with all of their belongings. It was a narrow escape from the Nazis. I mean, if you saw the drawer, there was a sense of desperation in that drawer. Little did I know how desperate it was or, or, or what it was related to, but you, you get the sense of, you know, this wasn't, you know, someone who was scrapbooking. This was somebody who was taking all those things in their life that were most important to them and hiding them away. That letter from Tel Aviv was from 1975, stating how much restitution the German government owed Helen. Tim found a letter from the Red Cross in there as well, along with condolences from around the world about Helen's brother and some fragile pieces of paper, letters in a cursive German script that Tim couldn't make out. Um, a woman was visiting from Germany and I gave her a couple of the letters to read and I was waiting you know, to find out that something was clandestine was going on and you know, she came back just in tears. And, and because it was such, such she said, these are very personal letters, these are very intimate letters, she only would give me a summary or a, a sense of what had happened. And it was horrific and it had involved a child and um, it was unspeakable. Over the years, Tim asked other Germans if they would translate the letters for him. Each person came back in shock, telling Tim he was better off not knowing, just to forget about it, leave the past in the past. People that were reading them, they would give you the high-level overview, but they really didn't want to get into the specifics. So that the fact that they discussed that type of subject matter made me want to preserve them. Getting them professionally translated was a little too expensive for him at the time. So Tim tucked those letters back in that secret drawer, still hoping to find someone, someday, willing to lay out the history that was locked inside that German writing. Life happened, though, and those letters would sit for 25 more years. But fate was about to take a seat. This story takes a turn that neither Tim nor we expected. To Southern California. And the home of a Hollywood star. We flew into LA last night. We're on our way to Malibu, California, where Jane Seymour lives. And it's fascinating because this story might have never been told. Those letters might have never been translated. If it weren't for a Hollywood actress, Jane Seymour, and a chance meeting she had with Tim Mallard. You know, it was several years ago when that happened, but why she stayed in touch with him? This is Jane Seymour. She's a Hollywood actress. She meets a lot of people. Why is she staying in touch with this guy from Dallas about these letters that are 70 years old? That's what I want to find out about. Something in these letters really resonated with her. If the airline put you in a different seat or on a different flight? We'd never have met him. And we wouldn't be here right now? We wouldn't be here by right now. I was crazy enough to say, hey, I make movies about this kind of stuff. This is, who knows what's in those letters? You should find out. Yeah, I know, it was a little audacious of me. Since so much of this story happened by chance, it is no surprise that that's how Tim and Jane met as well. On a flight to Nashville one morning. And the best part of it was the seat next to me was empty. And it stayed empty as we got closer and they were just about to close um, the door on the airplane when things changed. I was uh, trying to you know, put something in the overhead, as this always happens to me, because um, I can never reach it. So I'm always sort of jump up and down, I put it on my head, jump up and down until hopefully somebody around there decides that either they don't want to have the, you know, the suitcase land on their head or maybe they're just a gentleman. The right thing to do is to help her get her bag up. So I, I helped her and put the bag up to the compartment again. She has her bag to me the entire time and she made a joke about uh, little arms, short arms. And I'm thinking, gosh, I know that. It was an English voice. I'm like, I've heard that voice somewhere before. Apparently, I, I, I ignored him for a little while after saying thank you. So this is how I met. 
Tim Mallet. The conversation took off before the plane did. We started talking in general about life, and she mentioned that her mother uh, was in a Japanese internment camp. Jane's mother grew up in Indonesia, her father on the other side of the globe. He served in the Royal Air Force and eventually helped open the gates of the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in 1945. He, he just said it was, it was unreal. I mean, skeleton people were just skeletal. People were just with dead faces and people who um, had been through hell. And I think what he never really told me was which of his relatives had died there. I got vague bits, but never got the whole story from him. You know, people who survived the war never wanted to tell you what really happened. So as Tim and Jane reflected about the war, Tim mentioned his own loose connection. Those mysterious handwritten letters from someone named Olga Holsepfel that Tim discovered hidden in that old desk. She started asking questions and I couldn't answer the questions. And she said, uh, well, I don't understand how you don't know these things. And I said, well, I only have bits and pieces. Well, have you had them translated? And I said, no. And she said, well, you must. If they were important enough, I think she said, to be hidden away, they're important enough to be translated. Good point, Tim thought. He agreed he should end the suspense and just get them translated. Meine liebe, liebe Frau My Seba. dearest Mrs. Seba, you can hardly imagine the joy we felt when hearing from you. Haben Sie und Ihr Mann recht it is just so sad that it had to be under such horrible circumstances that led us to each other. You, know, you want to read it and you want to hide it. You, I mean, I understand why they were hidden. It's nothing you want to hold in your hand after you've read it. But it, it was so important that, that, that I knew it had to be saved. In the night from April 28th to the 29th, the Soviets came. The brute force, rape and looting we were exposed to in the basement by the Soviets cannot be described. In the closing days of World War II, as Russians smashed through what remained of the Nazi regime, Soviet soldiers wanted revenge. So as they fought their way into Germany, they looted. They terrorized citizens, and the letter said that they raped German women and German girls. Am 1. Mai, May 1st was a particularly bad day. Continuously, the Soviets entered, looted, and took possession of the young girls. They were particularly crazy about Ulla. Als Wiedertrag, when once again another three fellows entered and tried to drag Ulla away, they grabbed in despair the one thing they had always planned, potassium cyanide. When I realized that it was getting serious, I thought I was going to lose my mind. I didn't know there were mass suicides. I didn't understand that and, and I had no concept. Our history books don't talk about that. They don't talk about Mass suicides of German families is not that well known. But in late April 1945, exhausted by war and in fear of the future, thousands of German men and women killed their children and then took their own lives. Jane, when he finally got them translated, what was your reaction? I was stunned because it was a part of the war that I didn't know about. She's not the only one. But those fragile letters that a woman named Olga sent to Mrs. Seba, they revealed something else, something very personal. They are a first-hand account of one German family's almost unspeakable reality. In heartbreaking detail, the letters tell the final moments of Helen Seba's brother, Willie Weiss, his wife, Dora, and their 13-year-old daughter named Ursula, who was nicknamed Ola. Ola begged her father, let us die. The father did ask, do you really mean it, Ola? Yes, daddy, hurry up before they return. Ola sat on the couch. Willie gave her a shot first and followed with the poison. And after Ulla had ended her last breath, 
the parents laid her body down in the middle of their bed. Dora lay down beside her daughter, and with her, it took only 10 minutes to enter into eternity. Willie was talking to her. Petina, the way he called her intimately. Can you still see me? She whispered, yes. Once more thereafter, do you still hear me? Another whisper, yes. And then there was silence. Nearly 700 human beings ended their lives in our little town. Have you ever been sucker punched? Uh, it, it, it went, you hear people say gut wrenching, but until you get that deep feeling in the pit of your stomach, it, it is somewhere between nausea and intense pain. And um, it, it, it hurt your heart to read it. 13 year old Ula Weiss and her parents took their lives on May 1st, 1945. 24 hours earlier, Hitler is said to have killed himself about an hour south in his Berlin bunker. The war in Europe was coming to an end, but the Weisses were not Nazis. They were just regular Germans, citizens, civilians, trapped by war. And like many families in small German towns, they chose to commit suicide, fearing the fate the Soviets might bring. I guess there is still a lot to say, but you can only do that by talking. Stay healthy. Sincere greetings to you, your husband, and the children. Yours, Olga Holzapfel. But again, who was Olga Holzapfel, Tim thought? And why was she in the apartment when the Weisses took their lives? That devastating translation created new questions for Tim. I think she wanted his sister to know how he died and why he died and what those circumstances were. So she took the leap and documented it, word for word. I went, oh my gosh, Tim, this is just, this is staggering. I mean, this, this story is staggering. I mean, someone's got to hear about this story. You know, people talk about wars in terms of number of troops, number of people murdered, number of cities burned, you know, years it took, treaties. They don't talk about the individual story of a family where there's a, you know, a man and woman and one child and they had to go through such terrible atrocities and then so bad that their child, their 13 year old child begs them all to take their lives. Struck by the horror of all of it, Jane Seymour told Tim there had to be something else. Could there be relatives alive somewhere, someone else related to Mrs. Seba? And I said, well, you have to promise that if I find a family member, you've got to be there when these get reunited. So I went on Ancestry and I typed in the Zeba name and another name uh, was connected to it and it came up with Pringham. Like that's odd and I, I remember that there was another name in the desk on one of the letters that looked like Pringham but I hadn't given it much thought because it really wasn't associated to it. Tim found a Frank Pringham in Atlanta and then noticed another clue on Frank's Facebook page. This old black and white profile picture. Tim zeroed in on the woman in the image, thinking that she kind of looked like Helen Seba. Hey, Frank. Anybody home? Yeah, you got me? I got you. Can you tell me your reaction when, when Tim reached out originally? Yeah, you know, I retired about a year ago, and uh, life was running smoothly, no drama. And then all of a sudden, I get this, uh, I get this email from a total stranger from Texas, uh, stating that he has some information about my family. Turns out, Frank Pringham there is Helen Seba's grandson. That means Willie Weiss, whose final moments at the end of the war were detailed in that letter. He would be Frank's great uncle. He thought that I was trying to scam him at some level. And I remember the very first phone call was very much a cold call. And I got on the phone with Frank and I told him what they were related to. And within two minutes, he said, you know, I know nothing about my mother's side of the family. You didn't know anything about these letters, I guess, right, Frank? 
I knew nothing about them, you know. Uh, my grandmother never talked about uh, any of this. My mother never talked any, anything about this. And he said that in the very last days of uh, Helen's life, she had reverted to speaking German and was talking about a brother that nobody knew that she had. A brother who, along with hundreds of others in Germany, took his own life in the final days of World War II. When Tim discovered all this stuff, you know, a whole new world opened up to me. It, it was incredible. Why do you think she saved these letters? I, that's, a, that's a question we may not be able to answer. Uh, I don't know if she intended anybody to s see them, but obviously she was hesitant in throwing them away. I called Jane and I said, I found them. So Frank Pringham flew in from Atlanta to meet Tim and see his grandmother's old desk that he and his brother sold at that estate sale years ago. He actually helped extend a branch of my family tree because I knew a lot about my paternal grandparents, not a whole lot about my maternal grandparents, which are the Vices and the Zebas. So he's opened up a whole new, literally a branch of the family tree for me. And Jane Seymour kept her promise as well. After a chance meeting with Tim in which she convinced him to finally get those letters translated, the Hollywood actress flew in herself to meet Frank in person and see the only tangible evidence of a little known tragedy. Do you remember how to open it? No, it was always open when I, when I saw it, I think. So if you take the key, you have to push, push in into the desk, hold the front piece in, push, push in and turn the key. Okay, and just, it'll come down, the key will be fine. Do you know where the secret compartment is? No. Since you missed I it wasn't the last that, time. I wasn't that bold back then. <laughs> Can neither of you tell where the compartment hey, is? I'm looking, I used to have a secret compartment. Yeah. Uh, I would imagine behind here, wouldn't it? Yeah, take, pull it, take it's a on it. Trust me. You've rehearsed this before. Oh no, look no. at this. Oh wow. Frank hadn't laid eyes on it since his grandmother died in 1989, and he never knew the family's secrets that it held. It's fragile. I know millions oh, of families yeah. got those. Yeah, I remember reading this. That's the Red Cross um, notification telling your grandmother yeah. that her brother, his wife, and uh, their daughter died. That typewritten message officially confirmed for Mrs. Sebo what those handwritten letters first described. That her brother Willie and his family did not survive the war. What's interesting though, it took the German Red Cross two and a half years after all the fighting to send Mrs. Seba that death notice. It was dated January 1948. Olga's letter though arrived 16 months earlier in October of 1946. You know, at the beginning of the journey, I was telling Frank, I really wanted to see a photo of the little girl. I just, I just yes. wanted to see this girl. And even as late as yesterday, I wanted to see the girl. And we met with Frank, and he's got all of these albums. And they're just... And you think you have her there? We don't, don't know. I don't know. But you know... You there's know, some people walking down the street. And when that first came out, I thought, oh my gosh, maybe there's like gold in there. or there, There's <laughs> treasure of some sort. And then I opened it as a bunch of letters and some photos. I don't think I understood the treasure Which that was in that treasure. drawer. That's you know, I think life gives you that ability to look back and say how that is treasure. That, that um, when we talked to the folks at the Holocaust Museum, she said, the woman I spoke to said, do you know how many survivors' family or how many families who lost someone would kill just to have one of those letters. Right. Exactly. And we've got a whole archive. But they first had to make sense of that archive. Figure out who's who. There's there's Max. Yep. Oh look, he's with your mom, right? He's with both of his daughters there. So. Is that Willie in the background? That's Willie, yeah, that's Willie from the picture here. Look at that. Yeah. So for weeks, Tim and Frank thumbed through old albums, closely examined pictures, passports, and paperwork. So here's the uh, Zeba file. <laughs> Where did you find this? Yes. I want to. I want to take time and get into your basement. Each piece a new clue, evidence of family that Frank never knew he had. But that looks like her handwriting. But but it's addressed to Leba Hilla. Um, he's got the hieroglyphics, and I've got the Rosetta Stone. So he had all the envelopes because Max collected stamps. So Max took the envelopes 
Aunt Omi or Helen took the letters and she hid them away in the desk. But Tim was looking for something else, something specific in all of this, a face to go with a name. Where is Allah? Surely she's going to be in some of these pictures. This is... I mean, if we could, for that, that's the gold, right? That's the nugget that we've been looking for. If we could find a, we've got everybody's face but all us. Ola is the 13-year-old girl, the frightened child who pleaded with her father to end their lives with cyanide rather than let the Russians do what they want with her. We think that there's, there's more to it, first of all. Um, and then I think we both agree that the story needs to be told. It's... Uh, when there's things we don't know still. Yeah. But I think it's we, a chase. It, it is. It's, it's like stuff. a. It, it, part of it is when you take some of the horror out of this, it's a mystery. It's a, it's a good mystery yeah, novel, isn't it? And there are clues we're, that are. Yeah, we're trying to get to the end. We're following. This is the amazing race. We're following these clues. We don't know where they're going to take us. They keep taking us to different places than we've imagined. You know, I, I think we have different things we both want. I really want to see Ulla. I still, I, I want to, I want to see a picture of her. I want to hear more about the Weisses in general. As Nazis retreated and Soviet soldiers pushed in, the letters detailed more horror. What happened when the Weisses fled to the basement of their apartment building, hoping to hide? Dr. Weiss, had uh, and, and uh, his wife had the forethought to take their, you know, 13-year-old daughter and put her in a burlap sack, and he sat on her. But as he sat on her, the letters go in great detail to talk about how the Russians raped his wife uh, multiple times and um, forced him to watch. But soldiers later found Ola, and they took her away too, for who knows what kind of horror. They also raped the woman who wrote the letters, that refugee named Olga Holsepful. When the Russians said they were coming back for Ola a second time, it was only then, after a day of unbearable terror, that Willie and Dora and Ola together made that agonizing decision. Almost on my knees, I begged them to abandon their plan. This was probably the darkest day of my life, when I saw the three people, the only ones I knew, taken in front of my eyes. I pleaded to Dr. W., the last one to die, to take me with him. He would have done it. It was only enough for three, and thus I had to close the eyes of the person who was so good to me. We were in the flat with corpses for three days. We were supposed to dig a grave with our own hands and had to recover the dead. Um, for me, I, I really need to see, you know, if that letter was therapeutic for um, I'll go to write, I need to see that cellar, I need to see that basement and, and, and see that building. And you may not want to. Um, well, it's been, yeah. No, I, I, I could do that. I could do that. It's, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Google Earth shows the Weiss's old apartment building in Australitz. It actually still stands today. Frank flew home to Atlanta and once again spent days digging through the tops of closets and the bottom of boxes. Then a few weeks later, on a Saturday night, Frank sends us a text. Finally, a face with a name. This is Ola. A school portrait, the last known image of her. At age 13, she too was a veteran of war. You look at the school picture and she's devoid. She's flat. The, 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 the spark is gone. Something has happened. And, you know, I now know that her home was bombed in Hamburg and they fled and they fled east unfortunately towards Berlin and not west where they probably would have been safer or south and she had lost probably everything she had and that, that effect alone on a 12, 13 year old had to be tremendous and it showed in that photo. 
But Frank found more photographs. When she was younger, innocent, not knowing the world around her was at war. Seems like she was a, a burst of energy in life as she was described in the letters. And to get the photo, and the first photo I saw of her was a little girl. And, and when she was probably six and, I mean, joyful and at the beach and, and playing and, and another one of her uh, dancing at a festival with a little boy and, and you, you get this, this sense of, wow, this is a real live wire, this kid. And, and she is pretty too, she's just a beautiful child. This is, no, it's not. Finally, this story was starting to come together, but something still didn't make sense to Tim. First, about Frank. Well, well, he didn't identify as being Jewish, which had me a little perplexed. And then the bigger question. How in the world did Ulla and Willie and Dora survive as Jews in Germany up until the final weeks of the war? Well, I had uh, for years known of a gentleman who was actually from where the people in the letters were from, uh, from Konigsberg. My name was Wolfgang Julius leaving. When I came to the United States, I changed my first name to Walter. So it's Walter Julius Levy. I was born on June 9th, 1922 at 11.30 in the morning. I came just in time for lunch. Walter's family was similar to the Sabbaths. They both escaped Europe as the politics there deteriorated. The Seba's daughter named Hilda was about Walter's same age. And Walter can still recall the hatred he faced at school as a Jewish boy in the 1930s. I was disregarded by some teachers and by some fellow students. I was hit. I was uh, beaten. Uh, I was made fun of. Some teachers uh, were very nice, but they were afraid that if they give any preference to me, any indication of being nice, that being nice, that would be held against them. So Tim asked Walter to take a look at everything again. I did not expect this avalanche of material. Okay, I thought there were a few pieces of... Uh, German literature or something like that. So he, he shows up in my office with his German-English dictionary and a magnifying glass, and we went to work on the documents. He told me what they found in the, uh, in the desk. And he wanted to know what this is. What does it say? So we put them up on the television screen, and they were in the absolute worst German script I've ever seen, and Walter went through them one by one. Much of it was in German script, which I was taught when I was uh, in elementary school. Finally, the marriage record for Max and Helen Seba revealed something. And Walter, I remember him standing his face in the television screen, and he, he first cracked the term mosaic, uh, which he said that that's an, uh, another term for being Jewish. It's a follower of Moses. I'm like, well, there you have it. They're Jewish. Confirmed. And then he used another term, uh, something that sounded uh, like evangelical. And uh, he said, and it's not evangelical the way you know it. It means Protestant. I'm like, Protestant? Protestant next to Helen's name. So there it was. Max was Jewish, Helen was Protestant. They were a mixed marriage. So that meant that Helen's brother, Willie and Dora and Ulla, they were all Protestant as well. That's why they could move freely through Germany during the war without ever getting arrested. Finding out the religion doesn't make what happened to them any less tragic. It just adds a layer um, to the story and, and I'm sure they were living with the hope the war was coming to an end and they were going to get to be together with their family. And they made it, they made it till that last week and then the unthinkable happened. We noticed something in that beach photo. Behind the smiles, in the background there, the Nazi flag is planted. 
foreshadowing the nightmare to come. Yeah. See, I think we're missing the context right now. We're missing the context in which this happened. You know, it, it would love to find the graves. I think uh, we've got a photo of the graves, but I, I would like to visit visit the cemetery and, 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 and pay respects. I, I, I would uh, that that's important to me, yeah. to to these these I'm, wonderful people. I'm already buying flowers for the grave. How are you? From, yeah. But can they actually find the graves all these years later? More importantly, will the small German town of Neustrelitz even welcome Tim and Frank in their journey to find out what happened to the Weisses? Hard to believe that we're on our way. Um, hard to believe that that's the plane that is going to take us uh, there. Uh, don't know what to expect on this trip. Um, often wonder what my mom and dad and grandmother and grandfather are thinking right now going after this uh, this project, this uh, this story. One at a time, please step up. Look at the camera. All right. Thank you. Have a good flight. On my way down the veritable avionic gangplank. Not really. Heading down the walkway to catch my flight to London. Now, 76 years after that unimaginable day, Tim and Frank set out to retrace what happened, traveling to that small German town to see the cellar where the rapes occurred and the house where the Weisses ended their lives. Gentlemen. Hey. Frank. Oh, I didn't expect you behind me. How are you, man? Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. you too, man. How are you? How about you? We're on the back roads, essentially. It's the only way to get to this small town called Neustrelitz. It's where everything happens. It's about an hour and a half, two hours north of Berlin. And uh, that's where we're heading now. Tim and Frank are with us, and we're going to go see where it all happened. I'm not sure what we're going to find. Uh, I, I know if we, if we get to the grave, uh, I'm going to be overcome with a lot of emotion because it is family. Uh, family I never knew until, uh, you know, months ago. I think how normal and how bucolic everything is is, is uh, messing with my mind a little bit on, on the way up. The other place that we're attempting to get into is the, uh, the, is the house where the Weiss family lived. Uh, which uh, which started this whole thing when the when the Russians came in, knocked down the door. I, I want to see the cellar. I, I want to see the cellar. I want to see where these things happened. I, I want to walk down the stairs. I have an image of the stairs being very steep, and I want to get a sense of what that um, um, chamber of horrors is what I would call it was like. It's uh, the puzzles coming together. Neustrelitz is a couple of hours north of Berlin by car. It's a charming little place, quiet, idyllic, and welcoming, making it difficult to imagine the horror that happened here 76 years ago. We're walking to the archives in Neustrelitz. We get some information about the city. It's Matthias, right? We brought along a translator, a woman well. named Kedzia, there yeah. to help us navigate Australians. Yeah, archive. Oh, very good. Thank you. Frank and Tim hope the town archive might reveal some new clues. So that is our first stop, to meet a man named Matthias Scholz. That's, that's him, I bet. Hello. Hello. Matthias? Uh, yeah, good to see you. Nice to meet Pleasure. you. Pleasure. Yeah, yeah. I'm Frank. Hello. Oh. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Your, Your name, name is? My name is Dorothea. I'm uh. the head of uh, the country. Wonderful. Nice to meet you. Wonderful. Turns out the city museum here just happens to be inside oh, it is. what was the Maybe. old post office in Neustrelitz. Oh, wow. And that was a light bulb moment for Tim. So this is where Olga came and mailed the letters to Helen in England from this probably this very lobby, right? Yeah. 
So they came out of here to England, so we're standing in the same spot when she would have created the letters and sent them. Wow. During the siege of the Red Army of the town of Neustrelitz, everyone fled into the basement, reason being the many rapings by multiple Russian soldiers. I have a picture of her because she describes herself in one of the letters so well. She's, she's very withered and she's very um, frail. And she's, in the letters, she's, she's begging Helen to bring a penny's worth of thread and a penny's worth of needles so that she can tailor, you know, and, and earn, you know, a few marks here and there to survive. But Tim and Frank hoped Matthias and the city archivist could fill in some blanks in the story. For starters, who exactly was Olga Holsepfel? And how in the world did she come to witness such a tragedy? So, Olga Holzapfel, you have information on Olga Holzapfel? Yeah, Olga habe ich auch gefunden. She's the witness. She is the Zeugin, quasi. She wrote the letter, yes. Hier steht, also es hat auch dieses Sterberegistereintrag wieder. This also the death record. Can you tell us? Yeah. Hm? Die ist 1949 gestorben. She died 1949. Hier steht was ähm, zur Todesursache, Diabetes, Herz und Kreislauf. Um, the, the death cause was diabetes and um, heart and circulation problems. Do we know where she died? Um, wo starb sie? In ihrer Wohnung. In her apartment. Strelitzer Straße 16. In the Strelitzer Straße 16. Okay, so she stayed here. Mm -hmm. Is this it? This is it, right? 16? Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> Das ist diese Straße hier. Mystery solved. <laughs> it's this street actually. This street out here. This is the Strelitzer Straße. Where? Was it in one of these houses? She lived in the attic. So we're on Olga's street. Holy cow. This keeps happening. Yeah. It's it keeps happening like this. It's meant it, to be. This whole story is meant to be. Does it getting yeah. clues? Where is she from originally? Wo stammt sie ursprünglich her? Also from Königsberg. There you go. Okay. Mystery solved. So Omi might have. Sure. Helen knew her. Sure. So everybody is from Königsberg in these letters. They're all from Königsberg. Yeah. So maybe they were friends. One more mystery solved. This explains how the Weisses likely knew Olga Holsepfel. They were all from the same town. Konigsberg is to the east. It used to be part of Germany before the war. And probably why Willie and Dora took Olga in to shelter with them in Neustrelitz when fighting forced her to flee. The war rolled across the border of Eastern Prussia. Dr. W wrote, Olga, if you are in trouble, I will help you. Does it have her name before it was Holzapfel? Her a maiden name? How do you say maiden name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Warum sie so heißt? Sie war nicht verheiratet. She was never she married. married. So she was raped too. Yeah. Yeah. How old? What year was she born? She's 1881. 1881, she was born. Wow, so she was in her 60s. Yeah. My God. They raped an old woman and a, and a child. <sighs> On the top floor of the archives, locked inside a metal cabinet, is the first tangible evidence we saw of the mass suicides. The town keeps a ledger for every year. It's an annual list of every single person who dies in Neustrelitz. This is a small town, so most years have thin books. All except for one year, 1945. 
so many residents committed suicide, it takes two thick ledgers to list the names of each individual that died. Individuals like Willie, Dora, and Ola Weiss. We, we want to find the grave. Okay. We think we know where the grave is, right? War das auf dem anderen Friedhof voll und deswegen wohnen die dann halt da. Mm -hmm. um, okay, genau. so this is not the regular uh, cemetery where they are buried. And the lady responsible for the cemetery, she says most likely the uh, regular cemetery was just too uh, full. There was no space there anymore mm -hmm. because so many people died. So that's why they were buried in this uh, hero's cemetery. Can we go and see this? We have a picture of the grave. M Massengrab. Okay, she has uh, the instructions from uh, the responsible person of the cemetery, like where to go. An entry in the 1945 ledger tells where the Weisses were buried in a mass grave. And Frank had this black and white image of what it looked like decades ago. But the terror that this town experienced, Matthias told us, that's something that few people actually discuss. Um, I heard some stories from my grandmother. Um, when after the, the Russian invasion, she wasn't here in Mestrelitz, she was um, close on a, on, a, on a village and um, she told me that when the Russians came in, they were just looking for two things always. They were looking for clocks and they were looking for girls. Clocks, Matthias said there. Russians considered wristwatches that the Germans wore as high value loot and German girls they were simply revenge. Other people uh, killed um, themselves, like even before the Russian invaded here in Australia, be just because they were that much afraid. People were uh, going into the lake. So this, this was like, a, this is something like, like you hear, like I, what I heard here in this um, Glambecker See, the sea right in the city. The people killed themselves by going into, into that lake. That is the hardest to imagine, a suicide like that. Mothers and fathers using rope to tie themselves to their children and then drag everyone down the embankment and into the water until they were all submerged and drowned. Not just one family, dozens of them all over this town. I discovered that it was a widespread phenomenon that nobody talked about and nobody knew about, actually. That's Dr. Florian Huber. He's an author and historian who spent two years researching this little-known suicide epidemic in 1945. The very one in which the Weisses took their own lives. Huber documented everything he found in a book called Promise Me You'll Shoot Yourself. That title is a quote directly from the diary of another German civilian during that same time. This was a phenomenon that was happening all over Germany and especially of course in the East where um, the, the fear of the Soviet um, troops was so big and also where the killings and the rapes and, and the crimes of the soldiers were also very widespread. This really is one of the last untold stories of World War II. In Germany it is, absolutely. But one thing is nagged at us through the entire journey here. If suicide was so widespread in Germany, how is it so unknown? Turns out that's because where it happened in Germany. These small towns like Neustrelitz are in northeast Germany. Those are places that fell under Soviet control. For decades during the Cold War, Russians forbid anyone to even discuss it. And that almost erased the suicides and the rape from German history and from future generations, like Frank Pringham. Especially German women had to be aware that um, they were in big danger in the final weeks of the war because um, they were like um, the first victims of soldiers who's, who were looking for revenge. And um, we had so many cases of, I think, the, I think the figure of women who were being raped goes into the million. Rape, desperation, and panic. All that fueled the surge in suicide among ordinary Germans in 1945. And that is, the letter states, what led 13-year-old Ulla Weiss to beg her father to end their lives.
there it is. Is that it? It's the nicest house on the street. Oh my gosh. The apartment building at number four, Twatmanstrasse. Oh. Are you gonna, what are you gonna tell them? We're here, to visit where our relatives lived? Or that they died here, or maybe not? This is the place where the old letters that Tim found say it all happened. May 1st was a particularly bad day. Where Soviet soldiers raped Dora Weiss in the basement. The brute force, rape and looting we were exposed to in the basement by the Soviets cannot be described. Where her husband Willie was forced to watch while hiding their 13-year-old daughter named Ola by sitting on her in a burlap sack. And where on that same afternoon that Ola convinced her father to poison the family with cyanide so Soviet soldiers could not come back again for her. Ola begged her father, let us die. The father did ask, do you really mean it, Ola? Yes, daddy, hurry up before they return. The Weiss's home survived the war. But after coming all this way, there was one problem. We weren't quite sure how to get inside and see it. This is a private residence now, and will they really let a couple of curious Americans go down to the basement to look around? Weissner? Matthias from the City Museum agreed to go with us to do the talking, but he couldn't guarantee that Frank and Tim would set foot inside to see the cellar where these atrocities happened to Frank's relatives 76 years ago. My heart's pounding. The call box for the building is out on the sidewalk. Hello, Finally, a woman picks up. Moments later, this resident lets us step inside the doorway. As Matthias explains who Tim Mallet and Frank Pringham are, why they came so far, why they want to see the cellar. Yeah. Okay. Can, can I go? Okay. Oh my gosh. Here we go. Downstairs, there is a low ceiling, scattered light, and tight walls. Now that we finally made it, we don't really know what we're looking for, just looking. Today, part of the cellar is where residents wash laundry, store their bicycles, and hang garden tools. But knowing what happened to the Weisses inside these same walls still stirs a sick feeling. I wonder, I wonder how long they were in the basement yeah. and, and Willie sitting on the sack with Ula inside. Was it a couple of minutes before the Russians came? Was it a few hours? I mean, they obviously knew that Russians were about to descend on the house or at least the neighborhood. Yeah, I wonder if Ula saw what was happening to her mother or, or was she still in the, the sack? But yeah, because you don't think about that, do you? When they made him watch. Well, they, he didn't have a choice. He was there. See, in my mind, I made her safe. I, and that is so, so foolish on my part that I thought, okay, she's in the sack, she's safe. So they were probably hiding in one of these. Does she know? Have we told her what happened down here? Does she want to know? I can tell her what happened down here if she wants to know. The Russians made him watch while they raped his wife. And Dr. Weiss had a 13-year-old daughter, Dr. Weiss Ursula. Dr. Weiss had a 13-year-old daughter, she was Ursula. And she said, Daddy, I want to die. And the girl said, Papa, I want to die. Please kill me. Please kill me. 
Tim told the resident what Olga wrote, every detail in those letters, how women who lived in this very building were raped here, and how 13-year-old Ola convinced her family to commit suicide upstairs rather than wait for Soviet soldiers to return for her. The story was retold there in the basement, perhaps for the first time since it happened. But what was most remarkable in this moment is the resident's reaction. She stood stoic, unfazed by any of the horrid details about what happened in the place that she now calls home. Yeah, a lot of stories like this uh, happened here in, in different houses and yeah. like her parents and mother told her stories like that. Her parents moved to Neustrelitz in 1934. They witnessed what happened here and lived through it. And as we were discovering, this is an element of local history that no one really wants to remember. I thought she would have been more taken aback. I did too. I really did. But I think that her parents had gone through it. She had heard this. I think the people in that town know this. So it's like, of course, how could you have not known this? It's like, this happened. And to, I think she may have been more surprised that we didn't know it than anything else. I can't think of any other setting in the modern age in Western Europe where so many thousands of people killed themselves out of hopelessness, out of despair. But to fully understand what the Russians did to the Germans, you must remember what the Nazis first did to the Russians. There, were, there had also been mass rapes when the German army had invaded the Soviet Union and other countries. Um, rape is is a part of a um, war, unfortunately. In England, at the University of Manchester, Dr. Christian Gerschel is one of the few scholars to study the mass suicides in Germany. Ironic that so few have investigated it, considering thousands of ordinary Germans took their lives. Dr. Gerschel spent four years researching this and documented what he found in a book called Suicide in Nazi Germany. There was a certain feeling amongst the, the Red Army, uh, amongst Red Army soldiers, that um, their advance towards Germany was an opportunity for revenge. After all, the war crimes Germany had been committing in the Soviet Union, war crimes and the Holocaust, had cost the lives of millions and millions of Soviet civilians, Soviet soldiers, men, women, children. In Dr. Gershel's book, a few lines he wrote were just stunning to read. How during those final weeks of the war, Whole, good, church-going families took their lives, drowned themselves, hanged themselves, slit their wrists, or allowed themselves to be burned up inside their homes. The fact that so many civilians committed suicide in the final weeks of World War II seems particularly tragic that they couldn't see life beyond the Third Reich. We must remember that the Second World War, especially in its later stages, meant that People had to spend day and night fearing for their lives, spending day and night in air raid shelters, spending day and night trying to find enough food, spending day and night trying not to fall foul of increasing Nazi terror. We found out something else really interesting about that house when we were there. That the, the Russians? Yeah. The Russians were there until 1992 yeah. in that house? So the, these soldiers, the commanders, they take over the house after the Germans, in this case the Weisses. Not, not just for a few weeks or even a few years, but for a few decades. Yeah. When the war started, the Weisses actually lived in Hamburg. That's a big city in northern Germany. But when the Americans started bombing Hamburg, the Weisses fled for safety, and they fled east hoping that a small town like Neustrelitz might provide cover, or at least go unnoticed by Allied bombers. Heading east, though, that was a fateful move. And that's what Tim and Frank just can't get out of their minds. What if the Weisses had actually fled west, toward the Netherlands, or maybe France, where the Americans were approaching, instead of east, where the Soviets were closing in? Had the Weisses gone the other direction, their fate and what happened at number four Twachmannstrasse would likely have been very different. And Frank Pringham might have actually known Uncle Willie 
and his family. I think they knew even after the rapes there was more to come. And the soldiers said that to them with Ula, you know, we're going to come back and do some more. This was the apocalypse for yeah. that town, I think. Uh, yeah, and, and for them in particular, yeah. this they had already been bombed out. They, they knew what life was like in Hamburg and they had escaped that to come here and have it start over again. And they were already scrounging for food, we know in the letters. It, it, I think it was just over. And, in the fate, knowing as a parent that they weren't done with your daughter, yeah, and they were going to come back for it round was, two. It was a hopeless situation yeah, I mean. for them. But here's the central irony in the unraveling saga of Frank's family. Frank's Jewish side, his own grandparents, Max and Helen, they were able to escape the Nazis. But his Christian side, his great uncle Willie, Aunt Dora, and cousin Ulla, they became trapped and eventually forced to make that excruciating decision, a hopeless one, laid out in those letters as the worst of the war closed in around them. So this is where the vices are buried too. She's expecting us? Who goes first, Frank? No. She's got the robe, but they're looking for the woman. I think this weather is even more appropriate than sunshine for this visit. It shouldn't visit. be sunny in a day like today. No, not for this. Uh -huh. She's... So what are we doing? We find them. There's the map. The the coincide. I'm not sure if that will really help us. That will help us to find Olga's grave. Um which is in 14B. 14B. All the way up there. Well, oh, Frank, look for that. See, there's the, there's a black headstone. Right. Without guidance from the cemetery attendant, all we had to go on was this black and white photograph of what the Weiss's grave used to look like years ago. You found her? Luckily, Matthias yeah. caught the attendant oh. just before she left for the day. At the back of the cemetery, there behind a large stone, is where the bodies of more than 700 townspeople lie buried in a mass grave. The records say there were seven rows, some other records say there were uh, two more rows um, of, of graves. So they don't know exactly how many people died here. A lot of them who died here committed suicide. Yes, that's true. <clears throat> and also later, uh, a typhoid was coming into, into the city and also those who died of the typhoid fever, they oh, wow. uh, were buried here as well. Row two, <coughs> maybe. And they were buried in the second row. Yeah. So this should have been right here? right here where you go down the stairs. Did you ask her if I could put yeah. some flowers somewhere? Mm -hmm. Here it is. <sighs> That's what I had. There, here they are. Yeah. Is this where we think it? Uh, yeah. They're buried. Wow. Well, we know who you are now. <laughs> right? Yeah. <sighs> Uncle Willie. Aunt Dora. Even in a mass grave, the city ledger still recorded where each body was placed. Willie, Dora, and Ola Weiss lie there in the second row, just a few feet over from the steps. You want to put one down? I'm part of the family. <clears throat> Why don't we do for the three, right? So Ola's in the middle, Yeah. right? That's what she said. I'll say Dora is here and maybe Willie is there. Oh, how nice. On day four, everybody who chose to end their life, more than 500, was picked up and buried in mass graves. 
we shrouded our loved ones in jackets and blankets and managed for them to be laid to rest next to each other. Ullerchen in the middle, just like Dr. W wanted. Also that I exactly know the place where they are sleeping and I visit them every Sunday. Olga said that they wrapped um, Ulla in a jacket and they had the mother and the father in between. Yeah. So when they brought the bodies here, Olga placed them in the grave herself. The one letter says he wants to be buried in the garden, but the Russians wouldn't allow that. So because they committed suicide, which I still don't like that word. I, I mean, they had, you can't judge somebody. You can't, they were murdered. Fourth yeah. degree murder, if, if you want to put a Fourth? term on it. I'd put first. I mean, not to argue the point, it's just, I mean, you know, I feel like they're my family. I know you do. Welcome. Well, they were Welcome my family, family, weren't they? <laughs> For all those years, nobody know, knew them or cared about them. Yeah. Yeah. You were the caretaker. Yeah. <clears throat> well, they were in that drawer, right? Mm-hmm. That's where they were buried. They were buried, yeah. Yeah, they were buried in the drawer. Yeah. Just in, in name only. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. I'm, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. Crazy. What a journey. What an adventure. It's good. I have to step away. Sorry. I don't know. No. his family and I'm the one that breaks down. I just thought because they've been with me, I mean they've been part of my life since I was in my 20, early 20s. So these people have always been with me and um, I mean I didn't know who they were, but they were special. I knew somebody loved them enough to hide them away and, and take care of them. And then they gave them by chance to me and now we've got to give them back Frank. A few hundred feet away between a couple of trees in an unmarked grave is where cemetery records show that Olga was buried. The refugee who was a family friend of the Weisses and documented their deaths in those letters. So Frank, she had my job first. She was the witness. She, she was, was no, she had yeah, she, she was the first one that had it, and then described. she gave me her job, so I had it. Yeah. She was the first person that took care of them. Hmm. So she passed the mantle to me. Yeah. Oh, you got a good one. Okay. I saved one. For them. This makes sense. I got four that. Very good. Belong. Somewhere in here. Okay, we think Olga. At the end of the day, this is the person who left us this legacy. And she sits here with no family. She's the messenger. Yeah. At least the vices have yeah. family. Well, she probably thought of the Weiss as his family. I'm sure she did. <clears throat> if they took her in and they knew each other in Konigsberg. Well, Mrs. Holtzapfel, you have a new family here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll remember you. Yeah. The world will remember you. Frank was right. The weather was appropriate for our visit. As we begin to walk away, though, we turn back and saw something. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I kind of lost it at the end as we were walking away. These are my relatives, you know. These are uh, these are Zebas that I never knew, and now, you know, thanks to you guys, Tim, uh, they've been given a, a, a personality and, and something I can go home with. Tim, this all started with a $25 desk that you didn't want. Why was this so personal to you? The, I didn't know them, but I, I walked into the most intimate parts of their lives, the, the very most intimate 
parts of their lives, and it, it was it was very sacred, if that makes any sense. If you guys hadn't have pursued this, tracked them down, they might have been three people that history would have forgotten. They were, yeah, they were three people that history had forgotten. So there were always there was always one person that knew who they were, but they were just one person away from being totally gone forever. Totally gone forever. The Weiss's own relatives, like Frank there, never knew this part of his family even existed. When Frank's grandmother, Helen Seba, died, the memory of the Weiss's did too. They were gone, erased from history, until Tim bought that desk and unlocked this tragic chapter of that war. I think the fact that this lady wrote that letter, or those letters, um, was not just important for the people who received it, but it's important for everyone to know that these atrocities occurred. Atrocities erased by the passage of time, along with three souls, resurrected from history, who will now live on through these letters.